No. Uh, so, universal access to uh, all human knowledge. The Ptolemaic kings were into it uh, in ancient Egypt. Uh, the great Islamic uh, caliphs were into it. The Enlightenment thinkers were definitely uh, into it. And now, now that we have a real and proper uh, definition uh, of the people and the stakeholders in that project, so that it includes all people on the planet, all colors of people, all genders of people, all the classes and religions, even people who, like my wife, are left-handed. Um, <laughs> now, yeah, now that we have the internet on the top of things, uh, we may have a real and true opportunity to realize. Uh, there are five institutions in the world who I think are leading this uh, effort. Wikipedia, the Internet Archive, wait for it, uh, MIT, Creative Commons, and one other, uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which when I was growing up uh, in its shadow in New York uh, City was the stuffiest, most conservative, lockjawed, uh, institution uh, in in all of New York. Uh, they didn't let you in, I think, unless you unless you had a British British accent. <laughs> um, our new friend Louis Cano, uh is chief digital officer uh, of that museum today, and the thrill ride uh, that he will take you on this afternoon uh, as one of the leaders in knowledge publishing. Uh, as one of the leaders in advanced appropriate licensing uh, of digital content is brought to you by uh, our MIT Office of Open Learning, by the Knowledge Futures Group, um, a new joint initiative of the MIT Press and MIT Media Lab, and uh, by Charles uh, Nesson and Fern uh, Nesson, who <laughs> took us out to the most amazing dinner. <laughs> uh, last night uh, in Cambridge. Uh, Loic, by way of a telescope introduction, um, can take you, as he took me, um, on a private tour of the physical temple of Ben Nur. Uh, all 800 tons of it, uh, uh, sunlit Aeolian sandstone, built uh, almost exactly at the start of the common era and sitting there now uh, on Fifth Avenue and 84th Street, uh, but you, you know you have to be wise enough to get an early morning appointment with him before 10, which is when the museum uh, opens. Uh, more important, perhaps, he is also uh, he has the distinction of holding uh, the only joint international press conference that I know with Wikipedia and Creative Commons. His work is amazing. Uh, with luck. It will prove inspirational. Ladies and gentlemen, Louis. Hi, thank you for that introduction. Thank you, everyone, for, uh, for coming. It's lovely to be here. Um, it's, um, <coughs> yeah, I've given this as a title to my talk because I think, as you'll find, this question of open and why open is important is one that we focus on much more now at the Met than ever before. And hopefully at the end of this talk, you'll realize why. Um, and um, yeah, I'll give that as my, as a, I can spend a little bit of time though giving some pre-open history of the Met as well. I think it's important for us to understand whatever we're doing now in, <coughs> within the history of the institution we're working in. And I happen to work in one which is 150 years old. Um, here it is, if this works, come on. There it is. Who's, who's been there? Isn't it amazing? I mean, just people smile when they think of the Met. Um, I, I smile when I think of the Met. I get to think of it every day. Um, it really is um, one of the remarkable places, I believe, in the world. Um, we have some of the world's best content. Um, I, um, I put some slides together just to, 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 to just refresh memories of what this place is like. Um, the Temple of Zenda, um, Roman and Greek halls. I actually walk through this hallway every day to work. Um, it's definitely a privilege. Um, and you know, just to give you a sense of scale, so the museum has about 1.5 million artworks. Um, we have about 2,000 employees. 
we have an operational budget of around three hundred uh, million dollars. Um, I always give those to give a sense of scale. I think the Met is kind of singular in many ways in terms of its scale um, compared to other cultural institutions in terms of the collection it holds. And I just put up some images behind us. Um, so I run my, my role there is to run the digitization of the museum. Um, so that means all kinds of good things and evil things across the institution. Um, it really means how the museum is responding to the idea that digital now exists. Like how should we adapt how we respond to the museum's mission because we now have digital technologies to work with. Um, so we have this new force that's come in. How does the museum respond to it? How does, the, how does this 150 odd institution react to digital? Um, so that's like the catchphrase I normally use to describe what my role is. Um, to give you a sense of what that involves in a tactical sense, I oversee a department of about 60 people um, covering everything from looking after our website, where we get about 31 million people a year coming to our website. Um, we have 7 million people to the building, just to give us a sense of scale, the differential between the two. Um, I, so we have the, the websites. We actually have all the transactional um, work that happens on those websites. Um, we look after all the, 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 the collections cataloging, um, which I find is actually one of the, an area of deep love, like the data itself, how we actually look after the data, so the collections database. We've currently digitized about 460,000 of our artworks. So there's about 1.5 million in total. 460 now have some sort of digital footprint. And of those 460,000, a proportion also have images associated with it. So you know, we've been going through this, you know, we've been, we've been cataloging the collection since day one when the collection started on library cards, um, or even on punch cards at one point in time. And now we're gently digitizing it. Um, I often find it kind of interesting that we refer to collections information as digital, because I always think it's kind of like passing through digital. But that's another question. Um, we have a, uh, we produce a lot of content internally as well from like to, to share the scholarship of a museum, from um, some time, timeline essays, every exhibition we create, we create online content about, um, blog posts. Um, we actually have our own internal film production unit as well. So we produce around 50 movies, 50 sh movies, short, short clips um, every single year. Um, my favorite, if anyone has any kids, um, younger than 10, met kids, is totally awesome. Um, this little video we created about our security guards, where James goes in and learns why you can't touch the art. Um, so just to give you a sense, it covers the full spectrum of digital activity, um, content production, data, um, data management, and product management. Um, and so here it is, the museum. I put this little question, can museums be disrupted? Because I often find when people talk about digital, um, they think about disruption. And one of the things I read that at the end of this hour, I hope you've kind of come with me on this journey of um, is Museums are actually, you know, we've been here 150 years. Uh, I mean, it's existed for 150 years. And what's been remarkable to me as I've really got into museums um, is, like, is how kind of robust this business model is in many ways. Um, you know, we, they, they, we live in an endowment, effectively, a significant endowment with significant donations to a museum. And it means that we haven't had the same pressures as, say, the taxi industry or the hotel industry um, or media in terms of adapting our business model. If that makes sense. You know, when the bottom line drops out of your business model, you're like obligated to change how you work. Um, and that hasn't happened in museums because in many ways our financial business model is very robust. But a lot comes down to a question of, of, of relevance. And something I'll keep coming back to at this time is how do we maintain the relevance of the Met? Because I think that's actually the disruption space that I worry about the most at the Met. Um, this is our, uh, this is our the mission of a museum. Um, Met's, I'm going to read it out because I think it's, it's super important. So Met's part of the Museum of Art collects, presents, preserves, and studies in those maybe not in that order, collects, studies, preserves, and presents significant works of art across all times and cultures in order to connect people to creativity, knowledge, and ideas. Um, it's, a fan, it's a fantastic mission statement, I find. Um, and I particularly get hooked into this part, connecting people to creativity, knowledge, and ideas. Um, and that's where I think when you start thinking about what digital can do um, and where, where open starts kicking in. It's around this area, connecting people to knowledge, creativity, and ideas, and doing it on scale. Um, I do like to say, though, that you know, what we're doing now in the department is building on a, a, a legacy of thinking at the museum, because I mean, the digital, I can close this door, so we have a little speaker outside. Um, one second, sorry, oops. That'll do it. Um, apologies. Um, so you know, digital is not new to museums. I, I often, um, one of the things I always tell my team is I think when people make decisions based on it being new, they make really bad decisions. Um, so it's always important we know our history before we make a decision now. Um, I like to point out digital's been used at the Met for almost 50 years now. Um, here's a wonderful example of that. 
these were some of the very first audio guides um, the museum used back in the 1960s when people would basically rent these acousti guides um, to be guided around the museum and be given information about their visit. It was a way of a technology augmenting, helping people to connect to knowledge, creativity, and ideas. Um, and I actually have a uh, deep fascination with audio guides as a thing, because it's kind of the first technology to really enter the visitor experience in museums, which makes for a great case study. Um, and I, you're going to have to indulge me a moment, because I'm going to take us a little bit on audio guide history to understand why we do what we do now. Um, but can anyone guess when, well, we have to guess, the first audio guide, 1954. So if you think about 64 years now, we've been using technology in museums. Okay, so I, I kind of like to say that because, again, everyone, I, everyone always thinks of digital as this new thing. Um, I actually went and found these audio guides, and these, here they are, um, <coughs> these wonderful devices. Um, they're actually about the same size as an iPod Touch. They were used in the Stadwick Museum in Amsterdam. Um, everyone, anyone can guess what first technology, what, what technology system these audio guides used? Pre-cassette tapes. So cassette tape being a standardized format for audio comes in in the late 70s and 80s. It's actually using radio wave technology. So effectively, they were giving out like personalized radios to every single visitor of the, of the Stadelick Museum. And the idea was that they would, they would give you the audio, the content of the, of, the, of the collection, in French, English, German, and Dutch. So you could pick your tour. And of course, it's a broadcast, so everyone has to start at the same time. Uh, and just to give you a sense of what it would be like to take this experience, I think it's important that you know, what, often what I hear people say is as we introduce new technologies, we're changing the experience of a museum. And there's no doubt we are changing the experience of a museum. I just don't, I, if I just jumped in now and said we're changing it right now, people would go, oh, that's kind of, you're a heretic. Um, I want to make a point that actually this has been changing over time. Uh, I found this wonderful uh, piece of video footage of this particular audio guide in use. I just thought I'd just show it. So this is from 1954 at the Stadelick Museum, very first piece of museum technology. Um, and let's see if I can get this to work. So here they are. So as I mentioned, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a broadcast. So everyone hears the same thing at the same moment in time. So you're going to hear everyone having the same behaviors. Um, here you can see the back office. This is like equivalent to the servants right now. Um, we have the reel to reel audio player. It will go, they'll show it via the, the audio goes to an amplifier, and then from an amplifier to a converter, where they then show the radio wire that comes out of the machine. And, and basically, they installed wireless networks using radio cables around all the galleries they wanted to broadcast into. Here's the device. Really sharp piece of technology, actually made by Philips. Uh, Philips Electronics made this device. So it's disinfecting the earpieces, an important <laughs> component, distribution. Uh, there'd be an announcement and they'd say, if you want to take the tour in French, come now to the front desk. You'd come down to the front desk, you'd plug yourself in, and you'd start hearing the audio. The audio was for, a, for an exhibition on Vermeer paintings, real and fake Vermeer paintings. So people had to look closely at the painting, so they'll, they'll get asked to, you to look in the right corner. <laughs> I think it's kind of amazing to see this behavior existing in a museum. And the museum, really, what they loved about this is they could start quality controlling the kind of content that was going out about the museum. And they would get told to go into the next galleries. Um, so there was a quality control over the content. They were delivering content now in four different languages, so connecting to people in four different languages. There was lots of commentary, though, about the fact that when people listened to this audio, you had this kind of like disembodied army wandering around the museum. Because everyone's hearing the same audio, doing exactly the same thing at exactly the same time. Um, so that impact on behavior was something people really started talking about, and there's some great cartoons from the Dutch media at that moment in time, which people, uh, which people refer to. Let's, uh, I, I need to give a few more clips from that, from the history side, because audio guides kind of took off. And these are devices at the American Museum of Natural History, so it goes from Holland over to the, UK, to, um, the US. Remarkably, in, in the US, the technology gets bigger. Um, you get this briefcase version. Um, on the right-hand side, you have a gentleman's model with a headphone. On the, on the left-hand side, you have a lady with her wand who would not want to put something over her hair when she visits a museum. Um, this, was, this was a device they used at the National Gallery in 1958, so in, in, in DC. Um, I particularly love this image of the National Gallery, being, the National Gallery being, version being used. Can anyone guess who that might be in the, in the middle, wearing a velvet jacket? Everyone knows it's the queen wearing velvet. Um, but I love the idea when she comes to the National Gallery of Art in DC. The trustee and the director are so freaking excited about this that they, 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 they ask her to plug herself in and they, she puts this piece over her ear. Um, t 
to experience the museum, to connect to knowledge, creativity, and ideas in a different way. Um, and just to give you a sense of what connecting felt like at that moment in time, I've got a little sample of audio I just want to play, just to give you a sense of what the Queen would have been listening to. This is Perry Cox speaking. The pictures in this room were painted between 1400 and about 1575 by artists living in Flanders and Germany. Bernard Striegel, a native of Bavaria, painted the first pair of pictures, number one, which I think you get the idea. It's very, it's quite kind of a little, little bit dry, let's say. It was um, they, they actually called these ambulatory lectures. So it's an opportunity to take the lecture from the lecture theatre into the galleries and connect people that way. Um, there are various other audio guides that I find interesting from that time for us to understand technology in museums. But but the one other kind of standout version is actually one that was at the FDR house um, in Hyde Park in upstate New York, where Eleanor Roosevelt actually recorded the audio guide herself. Um, so you'd wander around the old uh, FDR house and you'd hear Eleanor Roosevelt giving the tour of what it was like living there. And just to give you a, a comparison of what that experience would have been like in 1959 when this one went live, I got a small clip of Eleanor Roosevelt talking about the living room um, in her property. Now the two chairs on each side of the fireplace to your left are the chairs given to the governor of the state of New York, which is used as his desk chair in his office while he's been there. Since my husband served two terms when he was governor, it was only two years for each term, so he had two chairs. He always sat on the left side. My mother-in-law sat in the one on the right side. And when he did not have cocktails before dinner in the little study, he... <coughs> so you get the idea. We're creating new kinds of museum experiences at this moment in time. And, you know, we also create, start creating new types of hardware. This is a device, actually, that I liked, particularly like this kind of harness version from the Field Museum in Chicago, where the remarkable thing they did was actually broadcast in multiple frequencies into the galleries. So you could start choosing your frequency to hear different kinds of audio. So they would have a long version and a short version inside the museum, depending on the kind of visit you wanted. So you start getting toward this idea of choice of experience that we now, I would say, kind of take for granted inside museums. Um, and it meant, meant uh, you know, sorry, so from there, you, kind of, you went towards these uh, these these reel-to-reel -reel portable players. So that's where we from radio technology to tape technology, not yet cassette tape, but uh, the still tape technology. And then when the Walkman really comes in in the 1980s, um, you start getting um, like more people getting involved in the creative production of these tours. And particularly, you have the Tutankhamun exhibitions that happened in the 1980s. I do think it's worth playing a sample of that tour. So again, just think about it in terms of a museum experience. You're going to Tutankhamun was one of the, music, the world's first, or America's first blockbuster exhibitions. Many people had their first museum visit, taking Tutankhamun, take, you know, going to a Tutankhamun exhibition. It's like, see everything from this, from this tomb in Egypt. Um, so think of lots of first time museum visitors, um, which I find deeply interesting. So I, as I always point out to my colleagues, more people don't go to the Met than do go to the Met. So we have seven million people that do, which is you know, one of the largest in, in among museums. I'm really interested in the remaining seven, bi seven billion people in the world, minus those seven who aren't coming. Um, that's our scalable audience. Um, so this was the experience that those first time visitors would have got if you went to the Tutankhamun exhibition. I was going to play a sample of the audio because again, I think it just takes us on that journey of what technology is doing to museums. Before you stretches the Valley of the Kings, parched and desolate a wasteland of sand. Here, the boy king, Tatankhamun, rested undisturbed in his stone tomb for 3,000 years. A brilliant archaeologist, Howard Carter, was convinced that the valley, long excavated by modern adventurers, still hid the tomb. Under the auspices of his noble patron, Clear. Yeah, it is very dramatic. A little, 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 little Hollywood-esque. Um, someone could say. Um, can anyone guess who the narrator was? That's Some, Orson Welles. That's Orson Welles. Yeah. So imagine you went to the night, you, you, you go and listen to the Tutankhamun exhibition, you go there, um, you just at the Young Museum in San, in San Fran, and it's like, you know, the audio guy, you get taken around the exhibition by Orson Welles, like, hell yeah, let's go. <laughs> um, now, of course, this is all cassette tape technology, and so it's interesting when you follow cassette tape technology because it also creates limits on how people are interacting with the museum. There are impacts on it, the technology is has a certain quality in, the, in which this linear. Um, so it meant when you went to the exhibition, and I haven't got the Tutankhamun map, unfortunately, but just to give you a sense, there's another one from, from a little bit earlier, you would have to follow this dance through the museum in order to follow the cassette tape tour. Because of course, if you wanted to, so you know, once you got round to kind of 
M, N, P, and Q. There really was a bit of a foxtrot to get round the corners and make sure you didn't get lost. Um, although it did result in some fantastic cartoons, and this one in particular I'm a big fan of. Um, I love that this technology, these technology changes, because each one is impacting how museums exist and what we think the museum experience is. Um, I want to give one last example, which is very close to home. Um, and it's this one, Masterpieces Without the Director. Okay, this is in the, in, in the 1980s again, um, and it was created by a group called Creative Times. Um, and what they did is they actually recorded visitors inside a museum in front of the objects, and then spliced it all together and created an audio guide out of it. So, and because it was unofficial, which is a kind of interesting, this idea, you know, I, I often have heard people talk about, you know, oh, you hear about user-generated content, this idea of users creating content for this sanctified space, the Met, or any museum for that matter. Um, so they actually did that, and they would just r rent the cassette tape outside the, outside the museum, and you'd put the cassette tape inside your own Walkman as you went around the museum, and you'd have a different type of experience. And so I was going to play you a short sample of this last clip, just to give you a sense of how this is impacting the Met in the 1980s. Um, and, um, yeah, so the first voice you'll hear is the narrator, followed by clips from the visitor. Maybe we will. And stone statue Whoops. that stands by itself in the middle of the corridor, King Metahuti, who is facing you with his arm crossed. Well, just go directly into gallery four, directly to the right. Please turn off your machine whenever you hear this signal. <laughs> that signal means that our next stop is more than a few steps away. Do remember, too, that you can rewind your machine at any time if you'd like to hear something over again, or you can fast forward if you hate this part, and I'll meet you when you are ready in Gallery 4. It's so alive, and it's so full of... It's perfect. In fact, every museum has one of these. Not to be brutally honest, it just reminds you of those boats and sushi bars. It looks like it's a funerary ornament from one of the pharaohs. I really enjoy the Egyptian ex exhibition they have. I think that they're enslaved because it's like people are used to wearing this kind of skirt and all this stuff. I guess that's, what, that's the way a boat works. They have these direct... That gives you a sense, again, different kind of museum experience being created. Um, so that's like four little snippets. And I, I'm going to stop my audio guide history there because that's where we hit the Met in this story, and the Met, as I say, has been using audio guides since the 1960s. And as we go through those four steps, what interests me when I look at it is a couple of things. First of all, the museum experience is changing, how people are experiencing a museum. I think very often we associate museums very much with this physical space. And certainly one of the things I want us to start thinking about is, is a museum more than this physical space? And what's the way of behaving in that physical space? And that's something that we, we look at a lot at the Met and we start thinking about open as well. Um, and the second thing is like, yeah, it really comes down to like, what is a museum? Genuinely, what is the museum the building? Um, so going back to where we were here, using that kind of historical knowledge of those kind of questions being tackled, I look now at how we today connect people to creativity, knowledge, and ideas, and the role of the department, of my department, in doing that. Um, there is this, this, this push that I often say, so if we go back to this mission, the Metropolitan Museum of Art collects studies, conserves and presents significant works of art from across all times and cultures in order to connect people to creativity, knowledge, and ideas. When I look at this, what really... What I focus on is the fact that there's no actual building mentioned in this. Okay, so what, what, what we need to think back to is like 148 years ago, so go, when the museum was founded, the building was effectively a tactic for fulfilling it. Genuinely, they, that, that was their mission. They thought, what's the best way of doing it? So now when I think, well, how can we fulfill that mission? Like, just take the mission in its, in its pure statement. What's the best way of doing it? First of all, you start thinking about what's the scale at which we can do it. And I have to admit, I, come f I look at it from the perspective that we have this am amazingly privileged collection. 1.5 million objects. We genuinely have one of the finest kind of content sets in humanity. I mean, I, it's a really incredible examples of creativity. So I tell, my, I tell our, my, the team, I tell the museum, we have an artwork that could connect with basically anyone in the world. Like that genuinely is reality. We could connect with every single per internet connected person in the world. Um, it's just a matter of removing those barriers between that person and the object that will inspire them. So you start thinking about what are those really big barriers? How can we really try and serve that mission on a on significant scale? And of course, to do that, we can't do it inside the building because only a certain number of people will ever come to New York. We need to start thinking about different ways of doing it. And that's where the team is now thinking about this. Um, so you know, initially, we thought about it in terms of our website. How, do we get like, how can we build a kind of website that people want to come to? And that for us meant, you know, we created a, a, a website that's now, that's now multilingual, so in 10 languages you can experience the highlights of the Met collection. Every single artwork which we digitize is available online with a significant amount of content around it. Um, and we get about 31 million people a year coming to it. It's a significant volume. 
But increasingly, if we start thinking about scaling, getting people to our website itself is a challenge. So we then decided to think, well, is it about actually just getting the content to where the people are? So we've really got into this idea now of like, if we want to make the collection the most relevant and accessible collection in the world, we need to actually take it off our website. We actually need to put it into those contexts where people are already. I often like to think, in the same way I said, like more people don't go to museums than do go to museums, I genuinely believe there are more people in the world who, sadly, believe museums aren't for them. Like there are more people in the world who think, oh, no, I'm not a big fan of museums. But I do actually believe the content inside the museum would inspire them. So then the question is, how can I remove that, that barrier, which is even the museum label, from the person discovering the object? Um, so that's the perception, the, the perspective we now take. We want to make this collection as accessible and relevant in the world as possible. Um, and I often think of it as an analogy I can give to it. You know, in the 1860s, it was a building, 95 is a website. I now think about it in terms of our online presence. So it's no longer just about our website. It's really about how the collection exists on the internet. And there's four major levers um, that we're using. Um, so the first is appropriate licensing, and that's where the open component comes in. Um, the second is really thinking about languages, how we can engage people across languages. The third is around APIs, so structured data. And the fourth is around partnerships. I actually just going to talk a little bit about the first and the fourth one, because I think that's what's most relevant to this group. I think the other two are more, I was going to say more simple, but non-English language pieces, APIs, um, like in terms of connected, connectivity for your collection is important. I'm not going to go too deep into that right now. I just want to talk about these top two, because they've been significant levers that we're pulling in terms of fulfilling our mission. Um, so the appropriate licenses one really intrigues me, um, because as a museum, and I think as many institutions as a whole, we've just used this C in a circle. Um, implicitly, pretty much all the content we've created. Um, and we made a decision in, in February of 2017 um, in a press conference with Wikipedia and Creative Commons, as mentioned, um, to release all of our data about our artworks and all images about public domain works CC0. So effectively now, anyone, we have 446,000 images available of public domain works from around the world which are available for people to use however they wish. Commercial, non-commercial, don't have to attribute. Um, they're just free to use. We also made the entire data set of every single artwork that's been digitized. There's about 460,000 artworks available for people to use however they wish as well, and that's published on GitHub. I'll go more into both of those components, but what really kind of struck me at that moment in time is like going, removing the, the, the C to the zero, there was no kind of cost to doing that in terms of, you know, there was no project cost. We weren't building a website, there were no developers. It was, a relatively, it was more a policy change, but the impact of it has been really significant. I think that's what really interests me about open and about these licenses. Um, I, I call it appropriate licensing, because I'm actually really, I'm, I don't, I, I'm not kind of an evangelist just for CC0. Um, I actively don't want to be an evangelist for CC0, but I do want to be, be an evangelist for someone thinking, like, what's the right license for my content? Because I think there has been a number of times where institutions such as the Met have used the C in a circle when there are probably other kind of license types which would be much more appropriate. Um, if we actually pointed out that actually the license we're using right now is blocking some of our content from being used in educational contexts. That's a barrier. So I, start, I look at this as kind of a slide and I would love to kind of like move our content from the right hand side more and more to the left. So I even look at what we did with the open access program with just our objects and our data, our images and our data was just a first step in that process. And we're now continuously trying to reevaluate our rights for all of our content to get them to be more and more open. So that's like one big component. To give you a sense of what that actually looks like um, online, um, it means that all of our artworks that are in the, public, in the public domain, we indicate it on the website, and from there you can download the image and really zoom in on these. Um, they're really incredible images. They go up to 8,000 pixels um, wide. So you know, it's a significant file to download. They're really incredible images. Um, oh, you can get, you can get closer. Um, we also made the data, so this is, when, when I talk about the data we made available about the objects, it's this data here inside the, inside the blue box. Um, you know, it's the, it's the title, the artist, the date, the culture, the size, the materials. Um, it's actually a really incredible data set of, of like human history for people to get into. Um, we've, I, I've got some examples of what people have done with it. Um, it's, all, it's all available on GitHub if people just want to go to GitHub now and download the whole thing as a CSV um, with the image URLs, the whole lot and just get the entire net content onto your laptop. Um, and it's interesting to see what people have done with it. We've had some people, I mean, this is my, one of my, my favorite ones. On 538, they, uh, someone, Oliver, did an analysis, took all the data and started looking at it through different lenses. Uh, intrinsically, his aim was to try and create new knowledge from the data. 
I think that's one of the things that really intrigues me about going open is this idea, I, mean, I, I think we have 2,000 very smart people working at the net, but there are another 7 billion people in the world, and I'm sure there's some very, very smart people who do things about data outside of that. And so opening it up so other people can start playing with our data and create that knowledge, I think is a really important step for us scaling the, scaling the mission. Um, he did, did a couple of great analyses. One I particularly liked was he looked at when things were acquired in different years um, in the Met collection. So you can see if an orange dot is something being acquired in that particular year. So you can see all the big excavations that were happening in Egypt at the turn of the 20th century, um, which is really, really interesting. And actually when American collecting started coming into force much later. Um, we've also, just to give you an another few kind of examples of this, um, this is somewhere at Parsons um, School of Design. We did a similar kind of, a, like a, a student class, I did a data visualization class using the metadata. Um, there's three projects I thought were awesome. The first one is this one, where he did the same thing almost as what Oliver did from 538. But again, looked at years of collections. So you can, start, you can see when the Egyptian objects kind of came in and then just stopped. The French had been on continuous growth. American got really a huge collection come into the museum in the 1960s. So by doing this, actually, you can start learning some things about social culture in, the, in America, like what becomes important at what moment in time for the Met to kind of to collect it. Because like what the, there is a certain, um, I know, something when, when the Met collects something, it's deemed to have reached a certain status. Hence, you can start seeing these trends in, uh, in collecting. Um, another project, actually, that was done by Ryan, um, which is really worth checking out, you can go to ryanbest.com and you'll find it, is he looked at certain, certain of our paintings such as this wheat field by Van Gogh, and looked at its exhibition history and its provenance history to track its itinerary for the last 100 years. So this path like, shows all the exhibitions since it originated in Paris, its tour around Europe, coming over to the US, then traveling to an exhibition in Japan before coming back to America, um, where it is now. So you start getting these trajectories of artworks, which I find kind of fascinating. You can probably do international art movement um, through this. Um, another example is this beautiful project um, where, where, um, where they used visual recognition on the Costume Institute collection to start finding trends in garments in the collection. So by passing visual recognition over all the images in a particular subset of a collection, the Costume Institute collection, they, started, they could actually start clustering objects by shape and start understanding, like doing processing in a way that human, humans can't do it, which I find really interesting. Um, then we have the more quirky examples, and I, I like this one. This is a particular artist who took static artworks in our collection and animated them. Um, and wrote a really fantastic blog post about why she thought a Kandinsky would move as she had made it um, right there. So those are examples of what people have done since we've gone open with the data. Um, and like, this, is, this is more on the individual scale um, as well. So these are individuals, micro scales, I like to think. Um, and these are all things that just could not have happened if we hadn't made that policy switch. And all of these are scaling the museum's impact in different ways and creating new knowledge to serve the Met's mission. Um, Another big component has been the partnerships. And for me, the partnerships is actually an extension of what Open is. It's because partnerships have allowed us to go towards other organizations, such as Wikipedia, and say, hey, this content is now available to use in a way that however you wish, effectively. And so partnerships is kind of us holding our hand with larger organizations to say, hey, this is the best way to use the data, and we help shape it with them. Um, I wanted to show this graph. Um, this is our website traffic um, as page views of the collection. Um, you can see 2017 versus 2016. Um, it's great. Our uh, traffic alternates with the school year, so you can see when the students are in or out. Um, and if I was to take the same line but add in traffic to our content on Wikipedia over exactly the same period since we launched Open Access, we've had a huge growth. Um, so if you go back to when we started back here, we're having about 4,000. So February is when we launched Open Access, we're having about 4,000 page views. Um, a month on Wikipedia and on our own website. The two were equal. And now we've gone up to around 10, 10 million a month, people experiencing Wikip uh, our content on Wikipedia. So now five times more people experience the Met's content on Wikipedia than they do on the Met's own website. And since that, it's gone up about another, another four million per month. So we're reaching around 14 to 15 million people experiencing the collection on Wikipedia. Um, to go a bit more in depth in that, because this is completely enabled by the community taking the content and using it online, um, these are just the kind of the big numbers. It's, what I did here is, is start looking at where people are going, what people are doing on Wikipedia. Just to give you an example, um, so these, these are all kind of 10 artworks in our collection. And the artworks, these are actually our 10 most popular on our own website. And you can compare traffic to our own website about this artwork to an artwork page on Wikipedia. So someone has created, for example, a page on the Great Wave on Wikipedia 
We have one on our website too, written by our curators. We have one written by the community. And it now has the Met's image right at the top, so people are accessing the content better. But you know, we're talking about orders of magnitude bigger um, in terms of people accessing that content. Um, and what's remarkable, I'll take the death of Socrates as another example, one of our most popular paintings by David. Um, just to be really clear, the dark blue is traffic to all languages, the light blue just in English content. So I think the fact that we're available in these other languages is really important to us. Um, and if I look at the death of Socrates in particular, that page now has been translated into 29 languages. Um, so that's something the Met just can't do. We can't translate on scale in that way. So the fact that this content is now available in multiple languages is, I think, personally, pretty awesome. Really different kind of experience. Going back to our audio guide examples, different kind of experience that someone's having of the image. We can control this one to the nth degree. This one, we, we can't. We can just make, our, make what we think is fantastic content available for people to react to and start using. Um, another example I really like is this one. Um, just to give you another lens. The, the previous graph I showed was our most popular artworks. These are the most popular articles on Wikipedia that contain a Met image. Okay, so the first one's Henry VIII, uh, little known king in the UK. Um, so we get around 200 visits um, a month to the object page of Henry VIII. We get about 400,000 people go to the equivalent page on Wikipedia. Um, really orders of magnitude difference. My two favorite actually are, are these two, and actually we're trying to push more of this kind of content. So the, the, the Wikipedia page about Iran and the Wikipedia page about Nigeria contains objects from the Mets collection now which is kind of awesome, because that's the context in which we want the content to start existing in. It's not that someone cares about museums, it's that they care, they care about Iran. And if they care about Iran, we want, we want the history of Iran to start, like, to start being illustrated by the Met's collection. So for me, what this does is it starts putting our content into new contexts. So we have a languages component and we have new contexts in a way the Met can't compete. It doesn't play to our strengths to even create this kind of volume of content. Again, it's a very different kind of experience of the collection. Um, if I take the Henry VIII one in particular, on the left-hand side is the Henry VIII on our website. Um, it's actually a really awesome piece of armor, because Henry VIII, by this point, had gout and was probably very unlikely to be wearing a piece of armor. But it was an, kind of a uh, performance of what he, how he wanted people to see him. So that's the object on our object page. Here's the artwork on the Wikipedia page. So it's a full scroll down to get to Henry VIII in that context. So it's a very different kind of experience about the artwork. It's not artwork-led experience in many ways. Um, so again, it's transforming how people are thinking about how we're engaging with these artworks. It's transforming how people think of even the primacy of the artwork. Um, that's causing all kinds of interesting conversations around how the museum feels even about people experiencing the content this way, especially in, in the fact that we now can't control the text next to it. It's being displayed with text written by other people. Um, but it is allowing us to scale our impact to a larger user base. Um, now I would say, so we've done it with Wikipedia now, and like when I think of partnerships, our aim is now to scale these out to other organizations. So Wikipedia is kind of a big one. Um, we've got things coming up now with Google. We're looking at the other major partners who control significant amounts of web traffic to get the collection into those spaces. And by, again, making the licensing simple, we're allowing ourselves, we're opening ourselves up to do that. Um, we actually even recently now started changing our, uh, our KPIs, our performance measures, for our digital program to move away from this idea that website visits are the most important thing. Um, you know, this, this, this number of website visits you'll find in our annual report going back for the last 10 years, and it's, it's, it's the success criteria, it's, it's the metric we use, very much like attendance is to the building. And now we're thinking more and more around measuring engagement with content, content consumption on third party platforms. Like that's the metric we're trying to go after now, which I find really interesting. Um, so it really is change, it's changing how we think about, about what the museum is as well. Because in, in many of these ways, when we went open, the thing we made open was the collection of the data. Like that's the valuable piece that people are now building on. And uh, more and more now, we're really playing with this idea um, of museum as platform. Um, I think there is a, you know, the one thing the museum has which is, is irrevocable, and like, which is very difficult to compete with us around, is the collection itself and the knowledge we've built around that collection. That's what we now want to make available. And if you take that concept, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll end off this one, if you take that concept and push it a little bit further, it really does get down to the idea that when the museum started, and we looked, the building really was just a tactic for fulfilling the mission. And so trying to make people think about what's the next tactic we're gonna be going to use, and try and codify that in a way that it becomes part of, part of the KPIs of the museum, part of its success criteria, I find deeply interesting. And that's the space we're now in, I think, the, having gone open um, 
I like to think that we had a, we had understanding maybe of like 80% of the potential like risks and impact of having gone open access, but there's still things now happening which we don't fully understand um, or we aren't fully anticipating, which I find very interesting. So I'm very interested now what will happen uh, what will happen next. And it does. That's why I want to end with this slide because it does all come back to that um, connecting connect to connect people to creativity, knowledge, and ideas. And because it, it's fascinating again to, to to do this at the Met, a space where so many people have a very personal relationship to an experience of that building. To say we're now transforming that, I find deeply interesting, and that's how the open part is helping us do it. Like, is your story what's happening at the Met? Thank you.